down right run low down dirty shame she calls herself ma rainey the second she low sings the blues i'm crazy about a married man and i'm scared to call his name i go and sing the blues i got to sing mostly everybody wants me then it's kind of hard. I know what I am. I'm a legend to the people at 70 years old singing the blues and dancing, too. And I know the old lady's doing all right. <laughs> I don't want to die singing the blues. If I do, I just have to. But I really love the blues. Is there any difference between the kind of blues you sing and what B.B. King sings? Uh, no, no. It's not much difference. Now, that's a dear friend of mine. Been not in BB for years. We work long, him and Bessie. We all been down on Bill Street, Memphis Slim, and all of us. We work when times was tough. We'd go out and make $3 some nights, divide it up amongst the people. We'd go down to the hamburger heaven on Bill, get 15 cents hamburger, three cent coffee. We were really living. <laughs> Is rock and roll ever the blues? No. Rock and roll never will be like the blues is. Of course, my friend, he made it on rock and roll. That 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 was in him. Who's that? And Ellis. I knew him when he was a little boy hmm. on Bill Street. And, uh, well, he made a great thing out of it. I guess everybody loved him. I know I did. We had a lot of good times together, and I guess I knew Elvis pretty well, about as well as anybody, and uh, kind of hard to talk with that jet in the background. Yes, thank you. Rock and roll star, Jerry Lee Lewis. Just respect him as for what he was. Uh, the first in, in, in the big rock and roll area, to, to break it open for everybody. So the king of rock and roll, you know. And... Uh, then I would say I would come in second. So. Well, I first heard Elvis Presley in uh, about 1955, I believe, uh, with a record called That's All Right, Mama, in Blue Moon of Kentucky. And uh, so the first thing he cut, that was the first record, right. And if I heard this, I said, well, now, there is my style of music. <laughs> and uh, I just couldn't believe it. I was sitting on the side of the bed, you know, and this man come on TV and said Elvis Presley was dead. And I, well, you just don't believe something like that right off. Oh, well, something's wrong somewhere, you know. And I said, this couldn't be. And I like losing Elvis Presley, but it's like losing a brother. And uh, Carl Perkins, composer of Blue Suede Shoes, knew him well. At that time, uh, Elvis, Johnny Cash, and myself had the same manager. We played uh, gymnasium, schoolhouses. Uh, you can see Elvis Presley, uh, Johnny Cash, myself, for uh, a dollar bill. We were one of the first uh, guys to record this type of music, which everybody back then was calling rockabilly. Uh, we called it feel-good music, music with a beat. And uh, But it was definitely Elvis's appeal to the young people who really broke this music open. He had something these kids were looking for, and he definitely, uh, and he opened that door. He did it. But when it comes to rock and roll, and it comes to, the, with the rhythm and blues flavor, because Elvis shook them hips like he was doing that rhythm and blues, and, then, and, it, and, it, and people loved it. Al Green makes his own kind of Memphis music. I think Presley had an had a influence on everybody's um uh musical approach when one guy was saying uh maybe like um uh, lord won't you help me and save me from all this work oh uh, all this all these things i have to do and then after a while he began to come to the point and say baby won't you help me and save me from my misery and pain you know and then al green comes along and said let's let's stay together loving you well you know, I mean, it's just, you know. I think he broke the ice for practically all great entertainers in that field. 
But until Elvis came along, the music business was mainly controlled from the Bell Building in New York. Chet Atkins. And he changed all that, thank goodness. Now you have places like Nashville and Florence and Memphis and everywhere. Chuck Berry remembers. Said Presley and uh, Sammy Davis was in the audience, you know. And near the end of the number and the show, uh, they uh, did a little step in the uh, high out there. They got up and danced a little bit. Boo, 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 boo. And uh, shaky legs, and of course he threw the spotlights on him, and of course that was, excuse me, a hell of a climax. <laughs> I think at the Manhattan Club that he used to rent out some, and uh, was Mitchell doing the music at that time? Yeah, yeah. Willie was doing the uh, music, and I don't know. I kind of miss those those old days. And uh, singer Charlie Rich came from the same clay as Presley. Elvis was a down to earth type. Uh, guy that, like I say, uh, we cotton pickers and that sort of thing could identify with. And uh, uh, he was, he, he was uh, yes, sir, and uh, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and that sort of thing, which is the southern uh, the way of life, so to speak. And he just, uh, I think even, uh, uh, you know, when he was 40 years old, he was still saying yes, sir, and no, sir, and that sort of thing. We all respect him from... For that reason, uh, as well as from the standpoint of living pretty close to the guy. A lot of times I felt sorry for the guy because <clears throat> the first time I ever saw Elvis, I was walking into a beer joint somewhere down here, and uh, uh, he and one of his guys drove by in a big, long uh, uh, Lincoln, I think, a uh, big, long limousine of some sort. And, uh, of course, I thought it was great then, you know, and uh, it was. But the guy was awful young to have to uh, start, you might say, hiding out. Elvis, I don't think it was any, probably any place in the world that he could go and walk down up one side of Main Street and down the other without somebody knowing. He had a lot more to put up with than, than anybody else in show business. Opera star Marguerite Piazza represents another side of Memphis music. Uh, Elvis had everything, and yet he had very little of anything. Too few people in this world realize what it is to be in nightclubs, uh, to work every night, to do two shows a night, and to be in demand like he was. It's no wonder. Now, at least I could go out and although people would ask for autographs and that sort of thing, they didn't mob me like they mobbed Elvis. They tore his clothes off. The poor man couldn't go anywhere. Had a lot of hangers on. A lot of people. Of course, he had his father, but he wasn't with his father all the time. He had all those people who were hangers on, as I call them. And they were there. What they did for him, I don't know. They surrounded him. I talked to Colonel Parker, uh, too, when he went into the army and um, I suggested that he could do better music because he had the voice to do better music. When you consider the fact that the Soviet Union sent flowers when he died, that has to be really something to think about. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Soviet Union would bother to send flowers to very many people in the world. Singing yeah, star Pat Boone. Yeah. We met for the first time in 1955 at a record hop in Cleveland. He, uh, he went on first because nobody knew Elvis yet. I closed the show that night. It's the last time anybody ever closed the show that Elvis was on. But I just stood in one place and patted my white buck and snapped my fingers. And uh, after Elvis, that wouldn't work. He was a giant. He was the king. And yet he was also a prisoner. His love affair with the public was um, both a joy and a torture. Uh, he was fat. He wasn't always singing his best. I think he was tortured emotionally. And yet that audience was there waiting for him, and he would go do it. Uh, but it didn't seem to matter whether he was good or not, whether he looked good or not. They, they went crazy anyway, and uh, I think there was a certain bizarre quality to that, which he, he recognized, that uh, it was no longer a matter of whether he was good or bad or good-looking or, or fat. Uh, they shrieked and screamed anyway, so what difference did it make? Well, I found that... Uh in the audiences that we have, it's it, it's mixed. It's it's older people, younger people, and 
and the very young and uh, all types of people, you know. Uh, uh, that one, Oso Mio, was the largest selling. And the next one, too, was Don't Be Cruel, I think, in Hound Dog. Hmm. Elvis. Hardburn Motel, whatever. Yes. Elvis. Well, I came in last night at very late. I had to go to bed because we we're having a rehearsal now, and you know, I go back to rehearsal after this press conference. Excuse me, Elvis. Unless you got something better in mind. <laughs> I think there's room for everybody, and I, I hate to criticize another performer, you know, but I'll take songs from anywhere, you know, or, or from anybody if they're good. It doesn't have to be in my company. It could be just completely an unknown person, or just anybody that writes a song. If they can get it to me, if it's good, I'll, I'll do it. And if they got good material, they're good songwriters. I think they should be heard. Because I'm, I'm, I'm just an entertainer, and I... Well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another, you know. So... It's very hard to live up to an image, I'll put it that way. Wait, come on, step aside, will you please? Elvis had been waiting, sitting there with his guitar, and during the waiting time, we had had a conversation. Marion McInnes worked at Sun Records. He said something to the effect, do you know anybody that wants a singer? And I said, well, what kind of a singer are you? And he says, well, I just sing everything. I, who do you sing like? I don't sing like nobody. We were probably halfway through the first side when I, two things happened. First of all, I looked out into the anteroom where all these people had been milling and waiting their turn. And they were all just glued to the window, watching and listening to him. And secondly, I recall that Sam had said, Sam Phillips had said several times, that he wished he could find a white singer with the soul and the feeling and the kind of voice to do the song, the what were then identified as rhythm and blues song. And I wrote across it, Elvis Presley, good ballad singer, save. When I first heard it, I thought it was a black guy, you know, but with a new sound. You know, Elliot Clark. He was a blues-oriented type. You know, this is what I think that made him so famous, all of us, you know, for him to catch on because of his new sound that he brought about, you know, especially from, you know, white vocals. Well, this type of music well, made people listen more to black music. And like we said, that it's going to last a year or two years. It's just a fad, but uh, it was one of the biggest fads, you know, that you could think of. Lasted a long time. Floyd Kramer recorded with Elvis. Uh, when I hear the record sheet that I've done 20 years ago, I can recall, you know, the studio and how it was, and it's a special moment. It's like a recorded part of history. It was exciting. He came in, and, and I guess, uh, as best I remember, like they had the song already picked out of what he's going to do. And we just went in there and made up, uh, listened to it, and made up an arrangement as we went, you know. The kids, the young people his age and younger, could relate. It was like they found their own thing, you know, and he was talking their kind of music, and it was something they felt like they discovered, too, a part of them. I took Elvis by his hand and slowly pulled him on stage, slowly. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis Presley, and never in your life have you seen such a surge of, of black faces all converging on that stage at the same time. Rufus Thomas caught the Presley appeal early. Now, prior to that now, the radio station, WDIA, was not playing any records of Elvis Presley. But after that night in the auditorium, Elvis Presley's record was played on WDIA. And I was the first one to play, and I think at one time the only black disc jockey to play Elvis's music. I know of only one other person that would have had that kind of magnitude that would just tend to pull people to them like that, just that kind of uh, magnet, just, just draw them in. The only other was Martin Luther King. J.D. Sumner is head of the quartet that toured with Elvis. 
How close would you consider yourself to Elvis? It varied quite a bit. Sometimes we're pretty close, and then sometimes we're pretty wide apart. But I knew him before he became uh, famous or popular because he was. Would come to our gospel concerts. He lived in the housing project. He would come to the concerts, and at times I would slip him in the back door because he didn't have enough money to come in the front door. When did you start playing with him? 1971. We started touring with him, toured with him until his death. I didn't really believe it until I saw uh, the body of Elvis in the casket. Uh, the colonel has pulled some tough things on publicity. Uh, the colonel, I think, is the smartest manager, the smartest promoter that's ever lived. And uh, it just hit my mind that, that he had gone a little too far this time, that Elvis really wasn't dead, that, uh, that uh, after a while we would find out that it was a publicity stunt, which would have been the publicity stunt of all times. 